Huh. <laughs> so I have this horrible confession to make to you this morning. I, uh, I didn't write you a sermon this week. I meant to. I really did. But, I mean, like I said to the kids earlier, this has been a long, long, hard week. I don't know if the rest of you are, are feeling it or not, and not just what's going on in, in the world. I, I went into this week with every good intention uh, of, of writing you this sermon, and I got up on Thursday, my reading and study day, the day that I come in here and I sketch it all out, and I woke up uh, to an email from my mother that a, a dear friend of the family, my first music teacher, had died a few days previously, and we had just found out. And that was kind of a blow. Not a great way to start your morning. And then I got into the office, and I opened up Facebook and found that another dear friend from my adult life, someone who had worked at the church where I did my student ministry, had died that morning as well. And so it was just kind of the one-two punch of, you know, adults who have inspired you and who you want to grow up to be even when you're still 30 were gone. And so I fell face first into the beginnings of the stages of grief. And I stared at my notes and I kind of half-heartedly was pulling up all of my Google searches that I put into Evernote for all the details that I was planning to pack into this sermon for you this morning, and I just stared, and I stared, and I stared, and I just couldn't work it up. I did not have the mental capacity in the midst of all that to, to put a sermon together. I was just, I was sitting at my table in my office, staring blankly at a computer screen for like an hour and a half until Jess checks in with me to say, how you doing? And I'm like, eh, not good, no. Why don't you go take a walk? Because I literally do need just to remind me to like get out of a chair and go walk occasionally. And I realized I hadn't been to the gym in like two weeks. I had been sick and then I had been busy. And it was two o'clock in the afternoon and I hadn't got a thing done with the sermon. I said, no, you're right, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to the gym and then I'm coming home. I need some exercise because I always feel a little better after I've been to the gym. It takes like all of my mental energy to get myself there every time I go. I assume it's gonna be a miserable experience. And then, you know, I get on the treadmill for a half an hour and I do those intervals and I climb up and down and I finish that and I check my heart rate and I finish up and then I go hit the weight room and I do my circuit. And for some reason my heart rate works harder when I'm doing the weights than it is when I'm doing the actual cardio. I don't understand it, but the endorphins release that lovely natural mind-altering drug that our bodies produce, and everything feels a little better. And I was still sad, but I kind of found a way through what was going on that day. So I went home and thought, yeah, okay, tomorrow, tomorrow I will be able to put this together. It's normally by day off, but it's been a long, weird week, and I'll come in on Friday, and I will do this sermon. And then Thursday night, I had a meeting, and meetings are never good for my state of mind. No offense to anyone I ever have a meeting with here. They're not my favorite thing to do, and they're not your favorite thing to do either. And at this particular meeting, which was not for the church, just so we can be clear about that, um, Somebody pushed my buttons. It takes a lot to push my buttons, but somebody pushed my buttons. And not just like once, but like you're waiting for the elevator and trying to get the car faster. They're just like, is this the button? Is this the button? Is this the button? Is this the button? So I went home angry. I was sad earlier in the day, and then I exercised, and then I was angry. Royally. And I went to bed that way. And they say never go to bed angry, and I did it anyway. And I woke up Friday morning even angrier, really, re I was in what you would call a mood Friday morning. So I'm already starting my day like that when I've got to sit down and I've got to write this sermon. And then I open up the news to the word from New Zealand. 
And then there's just the exhaustion and the grief all over again. And I was able to fall right into the grief stage, or the anger stage of grief right there again. And now I'm just sitting, staring at the computer screen again, cycling through news stories and looking for happy things and just trying to hold it together. You ever have those moments where you know you have to cry, but you don't have time to cry because you got stuff to do so I'm, I'm, I'm holding it in because I got stuff to do, but I can't do the stuff because I'm spending all my energy trying to not cry, and it's just this awful cycle over and over again. So once again, I am not getting the sermon done. And it's 2 o'clock again. So the hell with it. I'm going to go take myself on a movie date, which is exactly what I did. Because the movies always make me feel better. The movies always sometimes help me process the emotions I can't deal with. Sometimes it's nice just to sit in a darkened room where nobody can really see you ugly crying. Movie theaters are wonderful for that because they're the sort of place you can go in a room full of people and still be absolutely by yourself sometimes to just kind of have that moment. And what goes on on the screen is medicinal in some ways because especially when we're going through the hard emotions, you're sitting in the room with someone who's crying. What's the first human instinct sometimes? It's to, to look away so you don't get drawn in. Like, if you start crying, I'm going to start crying, so we're not going to deal with that right now. But when you go to the movies and you see someone going through the emotions, when you see someone being happy, our bodies and our psyches tend to mirror what we're seeing on the screen. Or if they're crying, we start to feel for them and we get in with it because our, our bodies and our psyches mirror the emotions going on in front of us. And when they're on a huge screen and it's a full frame close up on a face and that face is six feet tall, it's really hard to look away. And so there you are having that moment. Now, I'm going to admit the, the movie I went to see was Captain Marvel, so it wasn't exactly some kind of deep, dramatic classic, but I will say there was a tribute to Stan Lee at the very beginning, so I'm ugly crying before the movie even starts. Way to go, Marvel. But I had the moment. I processed the emotions I was going through. I cleared the system out. You know, you get the air bubbles out of the, out of the psyche so you can work again. So then it was Saturday. Well, crap, I'm going to have to work on Saturday to put a, put a sermon together for you. But Saturday is family day. Saturday is family day. It's the one day of the week I can be guaranteed that all of us are in the house at the same time without any real pressing business. And, and things can get done, like the cleaning that gets left to the side, which is, is not a fun activity, and yet somehow also cathartic. There is something satisfying about organizing a stack of papers that has overtaken your desk, finally getting all the stray dishes into the dishwasher so you can see the counter again, and it looks like maybe you can once again prepare food on it. Organizing the physical space helps to start kind of get the, the mind organized. And I was hoping maybe then that would get my thoughts organized for this sermon that I was going to give you today. But instead, I had a story pop into my head, which always tend to distract me, and, and they don't come frequently or as frequently as they used to. So when, when the story drops in your head, you sit down, you start organizing the notes, and you get ready to write it. So that's what I did. I started organizing notes for a, a story. It's, a, it's another one of those brand new wisdom tales that I just wrote. Um, it's not all the way on paper, but it goes something like this. Uh, there's a girl named Tana, and she lives in a village with her grandmother, who is the village healer, and she loves spending time with her grandmother and, and learning how all of the herbs work and how, how 
potions are, are put together. And she loves going out to the orchards in the village and spending time under her favorite tree and grabbing the fat pieces of fruit as they're ready and tasting it and letting the juices run down her chin. And she loves cooking at the fire with her grandmother at night and spending that time and hearing the stories. And this is how she spends her youth until she grows up and discovers that all this time she was learning how to become a healer too, but the village didn't need two healers, so she has to go on a, on a journey, which she frets about. She wants to step into this new life as a healer, but she's terrified of what she's leaving behind, and so her grandmother hands her a, a small sack to hang around her neck and says, whenever you need to remember home, whenever you need to touch everything, just remember to, to open this sack. And so she goes on this long, arduous journey up through the mountains and into the snow and back down again. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time to get where she's going, and she gets tired. And she's so content on getting where she's going and on how tiring the journey is, she forgets about the little sacket that her grandmother gave her until she finds she can walk no more. And one day she opens the sack and finds that inside is just this one seed, one stupid seed. And like Jack and the Beanstalk, she throws it away. She's really annoyed at her grandmother now. This was supposed to be, you know, the memory of happy things and it's a seed throws it away and goes to sleep on the side of the road and awakes in the middle of the night to find that her favorite tree has arisen in the night, fat with fruit. And so she sits under it and communes with her memories and is able to eat the fruit and is able to refuel and refresh and go on in her journey. And that's the basic gist of it. I think she probably needs some more conflict in the story to make it interesting at some point. But that's, that's where I was going. And that's what I spent my time doing was making the notes for this story instead of writing this sermon I wanted to give you today. Because sometimes engaging in art is the only appropriate response to the crap going on in the world. Sometimes when you can't put a word to a thing, when you can't name what it is that's bugging you, when you can't categorize it in logical ways, you just need the metaphors and the images to kind of help you process those things out. It eases us into figuring out the problems and gives us a new angle to view them from. Sometimes that's just the thing you need to do, which is why I don't have a sermon for you this morning. <laughs> and I'm bummed about it, because I really wanted to give this sermon to you today, too, because it's one I needed to hear, too. Often the things I'm preaching on are the things I need to remind myself of more than the gifts I need to give you in the moment, and this is one that I needed to hear because I left something really important out of last week's sermon, and I needed to come back to it for you all, and it was a pretty important note. Because last week I talked about us being pilgrims on a journey together, and once we realize that we are pilgrims and what a pilgrimage means, we are placed into the care of one another, and I made it sound like we were responsible for other people, and I forgot to tell you that the, the first person that you need to care for on this pilgrimage is yourself. You've got to take care of yourself, of your own soul. Not for selfish reasons. I mean, it can be a selfish thing, and it's okay to be a little selfish every once in a while, but it's not from a place of selfishness that you're taking care of yourself. It's just a matter of practicality because you can't care for others. You can't travel with others on this pilgrimage without your own soul being refreshed and refueled from time to time. The gas tank only lasts so long. And your fellow pilgrims, who you are also called to care for, need you to be a reasonably functioning human being in order to take care of them. So you gotta hit the rest stops every so often. You gotta hit the pause button. You gotta remember to eat. You gotta remember to breathe. You gotta remember to take a walk out in the fresh air every once in a while. You gotta remember to stop and take in the statues on the path. 
fill up your belly and fill up your lungs and fill up your eyes and fill up your soul. Fill yourself with whatever it is that feeds you and fuels you so you can get back on the road again, cared for and caring for other people. See to your own person so you can care for each person. I really wanted to give you that sermon this week. I really wanted to share with you why I love that particular gospel reading and that particular translation. It's because Eugene Peterson's use of language in here about falling into the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that phrase. It's so juicy. I just want to live in those three words when I get down and I'm feeling like nothing is okay. The unforced rhythms of grace. That's, that's Jesus calling out to me from 2,000 years back saying, dude, chill. Hit the pause. Take some time. The earth is going to continue to rotate with or without any discernible effort on your part. Take a nap. Take a break. Because here's the thing, sometimes, sometimes the journey is smooth. Sometimes we have lovely paved roads with the occasional pothole. <laughs> sometimes that journey is a slog, it's overgrown, or it's marshy, or the tar is a little soft. Sometimes the other drivers are just jerks, and they get to you, and you let them get to you, and sometimes... Sometimes there's a pilgrim who leaves the journey. Sometimes, sometimes there's a horrible accident. Sometimes it's just one of those things that just takes you out of the journey, takes everything you have. You gotta take care of yourself first before you can care for others. Be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself. How often are we kind to everyone around us and just awful to our own selves? Be gentle and kind with yourself. Go to the movies, spend time with loved ones, write a story, paint a picture, spring clean, sit by yourself, whatever it is that opens up your heart and gets it beating again. That's what I was hoping to share with you this week. But it was a rough week. And I had to take care of myself first. So I don't have a sermon today. I'll get you next time. <laughs>